are in listen-only mode. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Feifenberger and I work at the Ocean Alaska Science and Learning Center based at Kenai Fjords National Park. Um, we're very excited today to be able to bring to you a webinar on marine debris. And the webinar is brought, brought to you by the Pacific Ocean Education Team, or POET. And POET is an interdisciplinary team of National Park Service staff from both the Pacific West and Alaska regions. The team was established in 2008 uh, to enhance communication, education, and interpretive ocean stewardship efforts in the Pacific West and Alaska regions. We have a number of stated goals, including planning and scheduling ocean stewardship education sessions through trainings, workshops, and webinars. Uh, hence our uh, bi-monthly webinar series. We do this every couple of months. Um, past topics have included things like the benefits of marine protected areas, the vulnerability of coastlines to sea level rise, or current population trends and endangered stellar sea lions. Um, future Webinars will include uh, topics such as marine plastics and the toxicity of those plastics as they enter a food web. So that's an exciting one we have coming up um, later this year. So keep your ear to the ground. Your email um, is probably the best way to get notice of these things. Um, also, you can find recordings of the past webinars on the Ocean Alaska Science and Learning Center website. That's www.oceanalaska.org. And uh, it's not too hard to get a few clicks in there and find the webinars link. Um, so before we get started with uh, our speaker, I'd like to turn it over for a moment to John Morris. He's sort of running the uh, webinar software behind the scenes, and he wants to just orient us briefly to how that works. So take away, John. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, this is John Morris. So welcome, everyone. Uh, if you haven't been on the webinars before, it's pretty simple. Uh, you'll see the uh, visuals on the screen. Listen to the audio either through your computer or over the phone. I see most of you are on your computers. Uh, if you want to interact with us, uh, the best way to do that is by the chat box. So at the bottom of your control panel, you should see a box that says questions or chat. Uh, you can type a message there and send it to the staff here. and We'll monitor those questions and either respond directly to you in the chat box or uh, we'll be asking questions in the Q&A section towards the, uh, at the at the close of the presentation here. So uh, interact by that way anytime you wish to. Uh, and that's also where when you have questions in the Q&A time, you can type them in there. And then Jim will field them for the, the speaker. So questions or problems, just let me know. Uh, enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks, John. And as he said, what we'll do uh, is have um, our speaker give the whole webinar, and then we'll, take, we'll do a little series of question and answer at the end. Um, and so we're really happy today to have Peter Murphy with us. He's the Alaska coordinator for the uh, NOAA Marine Debris Program. And I don't really have anything more to say, so I think I'll turn it over to Peter at this point and get to the, the meat of the program, the thing that everybody's here to hear about. So take it away, Peter. Great. Thanks very much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you guys all today. Um, looking forward to it and um, talking about this kind of important issue, which I know is um, garnered a lot of attention um, to the issue of, of marine debris. So um, with that kind of a, a brief outline, um, first going to talk a little bit of background, both on the issue of marine debris in general, um, but then also specifically on the tsunami marine debris issue. And get some information on that. Talk about actions to this point, um, some lessons learned, some of the, uh, the, uh, some of the data that's coming out of it, and then um, potential opportunities for involvement. Um, and then some, hopefully some time for questions. So first, the NOAA Marine Debris Program. So a little bit about you know, this group. Obviously, I'm sure many of you in different you know, elements of life, whether that's personal fishing, whether that's um, you know, other, other elements, whether it's professional, have interacted with NOAA. And you know, there's a lot of different missions within NOAA. So one of them is the Marine Debris Program. Um, we operate out of the National Ocean Service. Um, so we're also like Office of Survey, those, that group. Um, we operate out of the Office of Response and Restoration, um, which is also where the Emergency Response Division is. It works with oil spills, um, as well as the Assessment Restoration Division that does a lot of long-term um, long cleanup of um, hazardous sites. We work out of that group, um, but we're a young, a young division. We only came around since uh, 2005 and are mandated by an act of Congress, the Marine Debris Research Prevention and Reduction Act of 2006. Now, that act actually does a pretty good job of describing what it is we do. Um, we work 
with marine debris throughout so throughout the different phases of it. So um, we work to research um, the impacts of marine debris. So to understand what's what's the you know what is the impact. So it's pretty clear to say that you know having something that's persistent or that's going to be in the water um, is going is a bad thing. But how you know what's the actual impact of it? Because with um, resources being limited, certainly it's important to prioritize our removal efforts. So removal, that's the reduction piece. We reduce the amount of marine debris that's out in the environment. Um, and that removal can act, or that reduction can actually come through prevention. So that's the, that third piece. A little bit out of order, but um, the, preventing people's behaviors of you know, marine debris. So we're going to be talking today about tsunami debris, but a lot of debris that ends up in the water is a result of you know, somebody's choice, whether that's improper disposal on land, at sea, um, you know, not quite making, making, taking the extra effort to put things to secure something, you know, that can end up with a lot of debris out in the water. So um, we want to prevent that um, by taking the outputs of our removal and our research and, and working to prevent more debris. Um, we're regionally structured, as, so I'm the Alaska Regional Coordinator. Um, we have regional coordinators um, scattered about uh, about the country. Uh, we've got one for, on the, in the Pacific area, though. We've got three. We have one for the West Coast. Uh, one for the Pacific Islands, and then one for Alaska. So talking about marine debris and, and the research on it, um, it's important to talk about the impacts. You know, why is this a, a negative thing? So these are images that are scattered around, but several actually from Alaska that show just kind of uh, different types of impacts. The top left, you see some derelict fishing nets that are sitting on a beach. Certainly um, old, old nets, other objects can have a significant impact um, on habitat in terms of smothering, whether that's coral in warmer environments or um, more actually colder environments too, and also on beaches themselves and pose an entanglement risk. Um, one of the things that's challenging about nets like that is that oftentimes by the time we clean them up on shore, a lot of the damage that they are going to do has already been done. Um, you know, they've already been out in the environment and potentially entangled and entrapped a lot of species. And you see that in that center image, that you know, nets that we've pulled up, that's an image, image from actually Puget Sound and Washington State. Um, but that shows that you know when you pull up an, an old net, you know, a lot of different species can be entangled. And at top right, you see that entanglement more you know in a specific marine mammal. Here is a seal. Um, you know that's uh, that you can see the entanglement hazard that these hose, I mean that this, these debris pose. So you can see in this it's an old line, but also packing bands, other objects can have both lethal and sublethal impacts to species. Um, but at bottom left, what you see is an actual image of, believe it or not, a NOAA research vessel out in the open Pacific that tangled its prop in um, derelict, derelict line. Uh, so in this case, the vessel was, was idle for a few hours, didn't have steerage. Luckily, the weather was fine, so it didn't pose a significant human health hazard. But you know, debris can also impact human health in that way. Um, but at bottom right, you see it's, it's an old derelict crab pot. Um, it's continuing to catch fish even after it's been lost. So you know the buoy line was struck or, or lost or short bag, you know, however it may be. But somehow the crab the, the crab pot was lost, and now it continues to fish. So marine debris can be pretty much as diverse an impact as the type of debris itself. Um, and it's important to note that you know, marine debris is already an existing problem, but also there's already existing work going on in Alaska on this issue. So um, here you can see a map of different different uh, projects that have happened, um, a lot of these through um, partners. So there's Island Trails Network in Kodiak, Marine Conservation Alliance Foundation down in Juneau, Gulf Alaska Keeper in Anchorage, um, as well as I know there's groups in Homer, Seward, um, and scattered throughout in Craig. And there's groups all throughout the state that are very active in this. And there is a marine debris community that's very active. Specifically, the Marine Reef Program, um, we've worked with 23 projects um, in Alaska just since our inception, um, but there were a lot of projects before then. Um, and those are research, outreach, and removal. Um, one specific project to highlight is actually out at Gore Point. Many of you are probably aware of this, but um, you can see the area that kind of zooms into that, that feature. And you can see the Gore Point just sticks out in the Gulf of Alaska and very much has that profile of a catcher beach. And sure enough, um, you know, this is the images from a cleanup back in 2006, 2007 from the Gulf of Alaska Keeper. And you can see that, you know, the, the Catcher beach there with a huge amount of log, which can be indicative, as many of you have probably have encountered, of, of potential debris. Um, but in this case, they were able to remove over 20 tons of debris from less than a mile of beach. So um, it shows kind of the densities of debris that already tend to aggregate in Alaska um, based on its position relative to ocean currents and 
um, and other features. So with that, talk more specifically about the tsunami debris and the tsunami event. So the tsunami was caused by a 9.0 magnitude earthquake that struck on March 11, 2011 and triggered a wave that reached over 120 feet high at its highest point. Um, that inundated over 217 square miles of the Japanese coastline. And that, if you put that in, in kind of rough perspective, um, that's when I did the math, that's equal to about 16% about of the combined city and borough of Anchorage. So a significant amount of land. Let me just kind of put that in perspective. Uh, the wave obviously had a tremendous impact on the land, but also on the human population as well, killing over 15. 15,000 people and leaving over 3,000 more missing uh, and, and expected or uh, suspected dead um, with hundreds of thousands left homeless and their lives very much impacted. And I think that's an important point to remember is that before we were thinking of this and working on it as a, as a, as a, a environmental issue or as a, as a debris issue or as a resource impact issue, it certainly was a, was and is a human tragedy that you know, the Japanese people are working to overcome and doing a tremendous job of, of recovering from and, and um, rehabilitating, but uh, certainly I think that's important to keep in perspective. So this wave created a significant amount of damage on shore, as you mentioned. Um, Japanese government estimates show that um, roughly 22 million tons of debris was created on land. Um, now, an important point to remember, though, and we'll talk about this more in more detail a little bit later, is that that amount of debris, that captures what was created on land. So um, as an example, if a, you know, a wave strikes a town and destroys all of the, the, the buildings in that town, it, that would be the sum weight of all of the buildings destroyed, not, not how much was refloated. And so this number was kind of early on used frequently in the media because there really wasn't a, another number to really take its place. However, more recently, just in the last few months, the Japanese government has released an estimate that shows that about 5 million tons of debris was actually refloated or was floated by as the wave retreated. And of, of that, about 70% sank near shore, leaving about 1.5 to 1.7 million tons of debris actively floating after the event. Um, and that jives with or agrees with um, experience and data from NOAA from other events, such as um, the American Samoa tsunami, as well as um, the storm surges from hurricanes in Katrina and Rita, which and you have the pattern of an inundation event that was able to float a, a significant amount of, of debris, but that the heavier debris and a lot of the debris that is heavy sinks near shore um, within a relatively short distance in time. So when we talk about this debris, though, what are we talking about? You know, what is this debris? So, I mean, these two images kind of show that that balance of the, the tsunami brought a lot of things onshore. You can see in the last image and then this one at left too. Um, you know, a, a vessel that's left on shore, a lot of um, a lot of infrastructure and, and destruction. But then at right, you see images of what was taken out um, offshore. So and really, it is you know a wide diversity of objects. You have an overturned vessel, um, roof of a small building, roof of another building, um, a lot of construction debris. Um, this image, if you if you get it in the larger format, you can zoom in really close. This is a U.S. Navy image from immediately after. Um, the tsunami so just a few days later, and you can see that you know there's household objects in there, but then also you see uh, derelict fishing gear, um, line, buoys, etc. And this next image just kind of shows this is from the Japanese sightings, but these are a little bit later. But again, it shows just the diversity of objects. So, fishing boat, a capsized fishing boat or a capsized vessel of some kind, um, fishing gear with totes, buoys, as well as you know. Um, old cylinders. Now, immediately after the tsunami, the debris was in concentration sufficient enough to where they could actually be seen by satellites. So at left, you see this image from a bit higher altitude than the last one, but similar time frame, just um, two days after the tsunami. Um, but you can see this debris in these large patches or aggregations. However, and you can see that in the satellite imagery at right, so those red um, that those red spots or red concentrations are tsunami debris or suspected to be tsunami debris. However, by about four weeks after the tsunami, you can no longer detect these objects in, in the area. Now, that's you know, not because the debris went away in a, uh, or you know, it's no longer present, but that 
it dispersed over space and time because um, as you uh, as you see the different types of objects that were there, lumber, uh, lumber is going to tend to you know become more waterlogged and sit lower in the water, and then um, and move in different speed and direction rather than you know a, a vessel or um, a lighter object that can sit high in the water and be blown more by wind. So as as McNoy detected debris, the question became about modeling the debris, so determining where it might go and when. So the initial efforts for modeling, um, two, two models were used primarily. These are um, an image of outputs from both of these. At left, you have the NOAA Oscars model, and at right, you have the University of Hawaii SCUD model. And these models take slightly different approaches, but they're trying to do this roughly the same thing, which is look at long-term historical winds and current data um, in order to look at what debris might do into the future. Um, so kind of the analogy that I've heard used and, and found helpful is that, you know, if you want to look at a forecast, if you want to know what the weather's going to be like you know, at the end of the week, you look at a forecast. If you want to know what the weather's going to be like next year, you look at an almanac, you know, get a sense of what normally happens. Um, you know, these, these models are using effectively those long-term statistics and long, and long databases in order to look at what are the average wind and weather conditions. And they were also looking at um, primarily current-driven debris, so debris that sat typically lower in the water and moved um, more based on currents rather than wind. So when we talk about this wind effect, we're talking about windage. Um, it's you know sort of a, a term that's used within within the modeling. Um, also, the Coast Guard calls it leeway. Um, but effectively, it's a combination of the area above the water um, versus the area below the water. So the area above the water um, gives you more area for wind to push against, whereas the area underneath the water um, gives you uh, gives you drags, slows the object down. So an object that's low in the water, under the water surface, really doesn't have wind value, so it's really going to move with currents. An object, uh, so that'd be like a like a nest or um, a piece of lumber that's you know very much that's heavy enough to where it's sitting you know right at the surface or underneath. Whereas an object like a um, you know like styrofoam or like um, for example the, the soccer ball that um, washed up on Middleton. You know, those are objects that tend to sit very high in the water and be influenced primarily by wind. Um, so more recently, we began to look at both currents or um, actual winds and currents data from the past year um, combined with scenarios to look at these windage values and to look at, okay, how would this debris um, move more quickly? Because we, you know, the earlier models were looking at current data. Um, and did a good job of informing kind of those, that that debris movement, um, but it was recognized that debris that sat higher in the water would move more quickly. Um, and these more recent efforts have allowed us to give a little more time span on that. So what you're looking at now is the, an output from the NOAA GNOME model, uh, which is spelled like the Alon GNOME. It's the General NOAA Operational Modeling Environment. Um, but basically, what we're looking at with this is looking at the overall distribution of simulated debris, so computer simulated particles, um, at varying windages. So from obviously low in the water to obviously very high in the water. You can see that kind of at upper right. And I apologize, this image got a little bit garbled in the PowerPoint translation. Um, but what it shows, and kind of boiling it down, is that high windage objects may have reached the Pacific Northwest coast, which includes British Columbia and, and Alaska, um, as early as the winter of 2011-2012. Um, but the majority of the particles in the model are still dispersed north um, and, well, generally north of the Hawaiian Islands. So that kind of gives the overall picture of, of the modeling efforts. However, while there's been modeling effort, there's also been working to, to also have detection and to be able to detect debris um, where it exists in the open ocean. Um, so what you see here is a map that shows um, sightings of debris or of suspected debris. So um, for those of you who are aware, we have an email address, disasterdebris at noaa.gov, where we're asking people to report in if they see objects that they believe could be from the tsunami. Um, because certainly one of the most important elements of this is um, you know, people's local knowledge of what is usual and unusual debris. Because as I mentioned earlier, Rain debris is already an existing issue in the world's oceans, and certainly, especially on Alaskans' coast, because of the again, it, Alaska tends to receive more um, more debris than other places in the in the country and the world, um, based on the oceanographic currents and 
and every and other phenomena. But so being able to distinguish tsunami debris from the existing debris that already shows up is can be a challenge. And so it's important to have that local knowledge of what is unusual, both in quantity, um, you know, how much, or in composition. So it's an unusual object. Um, so what you see here is a map. The yellow objects indicate potential tsunami debris um, that have been reported in, whereas the red triangles um, show confirmed tsunami debris. Um, so you can see the three confirmations that are on there, and there are more that are going to be added. We're updating this map just um, the next couple of days. Um, we kind of do it on schedule, but um, we'll be adding a few others, specifically the soccer ball on, on Middleton, which in this map, in, I think it got hidden underneath that star there. Um, but those are confirmed objects. Um, so in those cases, we were able to trace the object specifically back to its origin using an identifier. So in the case of the vessels, we could say, well, you know, here's the registration, here's where it came from, and we can trace that back. In the case of the soccer ball, there was certainly you know, written information written on, on the object. Um, in the case of the motorcycle that washed up in British Columbia, um, you know, again, there was registration. So those, that information can, very, can be very helpful. However, in the case of, for example, these buoys that you see, um, one from Hinchinbrook Island and one from down the Washington coast, um, those, are tr those are more difficult because while they certainly fit the profile of more rapidly moving and high floating debris, without a specific identifier, it's hard to say definitively that they came from the tsunami. Um, but we're still working to determine, um, to get more information about them so we can try to, try to do the best we can to trace them back. The other things you see on this um, same map, though, um, you'll notice some squares. There's some that are brown and then one that's kind of a lighter blue. Those are areas where we requested and received high-resolution satellite imagery because, um, as mentioned earlier, the satellites that were used immediately after the tsunami were at lower resolution, so they couldn't pick up debris. But we're working to try to identify debris using these higher-resolution satellite imagery. Um, so for, um, for orientation or kind of scale, this object that I'm circling here, which hopefully you can see the mouse cursor, um, but it's the longer polygon. Um, that's 1,000 kilometers long by 300 kilometers wide. So um, resulted in over 350 images to, that were analyzed. So it's a, the scale of the, of the overall target area is certainly um, a challenge, but we're trying to work with both models and then these sightings in order to narrow down where we're looking for debris. Um, the other thing that's reflected here is these stars, and uh, actually in these plus signs. We use, what those are are monitoring sites. So we're working with um, partners and, and different organizations to have monitoring sites where people are collecting on a regular basis, on a monthly basis ideally, um, data using a standardized data sheet and format so that people are, so that we can get a trend and get a baseline of what is showing up and be able to analyze for changes, again, in composition um, or in quantity. Um, in Alaska, we're working with um, NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service to extend a data set that they have at um, both Middleton, Kayak, Beach and Yakutat, and then Krutsoff Island. And we're actually working with National Park Service um, with folks who are going to be going out and doing field operations to integrate um, data collection with using the same protocol um, at uh, field stations um, out in the Alaska Peninsula. We're also working with Fish and Wildlife Service to build um, in the protocol at field camps out in the Aleutians. So although we don't have those on the map yet because we haven't gotten the, the exact location. So um, we're going to be getting those and, put it, and populating the map with those as well. As you can see, it's certainly, a, it, while there's modeling to try to understand where things are going and when, we also are working to, to gather you know, data on the ground and at sea to understand better where things are. And these sightings have come from the general public, but also from um, shipping industry, transportation industry, um, fishing fleets. So we're really trying to reach out as much as possible can to other groups to get in that data. So taken together, um, what do we know? Um, well, first, an important point is that tsunami debris added to an existing problem. As I mentioned earlier, um, debris is, marine debris has already been an issue and, and continues to be an issue um, for shorelines worldwide. Um, and so I think that's important to note that uh, it's added to that problem that was already there and that there are already a lot of people already working on um, within Alaska and other, and other states as well. Um, it is likely that much of the debris sank near shore off the Japanese coast, which agrees with data and experience from previous events. Um, the debris is dispersed in a lot in large concentrations or fields. Now, um, in those satellite detection areas, something I want to draw, want to mention, I neglected to, was that um, none of those have shown debris 
um, have we've been able to identify debris in those areas yet. Um, now, part of that certainly could be that the, um, the the sea state combined with cloud cover makes some of the areas um, difficult to survey or difficult to identify small objects. However, even in the case of a you know high sea state or higher sea state, um, you know the 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 data is at high enough resolution to where it could identify uh, or analysts would be able to note you know aggregations of like you know large rafts or islands or large objects like vessels. Um, so we haven't seen any of that, and also that aligns with just general debris behavior that it tends to spread out over space and time as, as it's acted upon by currents and winds differently. Um, radioactivity debris, um, consensus from experts across the board from um, different federal, state, local, and independent agencies is that um, contamination debris is highly unlikely. Um, that's backed up by several different, several different points. We can talk about that more later if there are questions. Um, sightings, we have five sightings confirmed tsunami debris as of the ninth as of uh, last week, um, but there are many more that are unconfirmed or potential tsunami debris. And so, um, for those, you know, as we're working with folks that are seeing debris objects in areas um, such as Prince William Sound, we'll talk about in a second. We're certainly working to get more information about those um, so that we can try to better understand how to essentially confirm them. So, on that point, talking a little bit about um, recent Prince William Sound sightings. Um, so many of you have probably seen these in the news and been aware of them, but you know, this an orientation of the Trenton Sound area is probably don't need to give, but um, some of the recent sightings there are on the 27th of, 27th of March um, on Middleton Island, not Montague, apologize for the typo there. Um, there was a soccer ball that was sighted, you know, many of you are aware of that, that generated some media interest. Um, but more recently on Montague Island, uh, um, there was Debris, there was a significant amount of debris sighted during a scouting mission for an existing marine debris cleanup that was going to happen out on Montague. Um, so that sighting was on the 25th of April. Um, there were buoys, styrofoam, um, and some limited household hazmat, so jerry cans, those sort of objects. Um, and then similarly, just a day later, we got reports from um, flyers out of Cordova, Alaska, who had sighted significant or, or unusual quantities of debris on Kayak Island, which both the outer coast of Kayak and Montague are generally um, aggregation points for debris. So you see a lot of debris there, but these are even unusual quantities from people who have been out there before. Um, so this kind of gives you a sense of what was seen on Kayak. Um, so this is from Gulf Alaska Keeper. Well, you can see buoys, um, so kind of those high windage objects, jerry can, um, you know, plastic, you know, plastic float of some kind. So typically these, these higher windage objects. Um, there was also a subsequent overflight on the 28th of on the 28th of April um, to look specifically at Montague um, and to investigate the hazmat reports, but uh, they, they did not find hazmat at levels of that would necessitate an emergency response. But they did cite significant amounts of of this high windage debris, so it gave more data for that area. You can see here um, this image that shows um, these high windage objects. So. Um, black floats, um, as well as styrofoam floats, um, and small objects that tend to sit higher in the water. So kind of summarizing, you know, putting this together, you know, what are the different kind of actions that are ongoing? Well, first um, is detection. So working to identify the debris at sea and on shorelines um, as it arrives. So working with satellites, um, volunteer aerial observations, as well as vessels. So working with the different fishing, fishing groups, shipping groups, Coast Guard, and others to report in what they see when they're out in the water. And then that goes hand in hand with modeling, so working to, to model debris movement and understand better where and when it might arrive um, with you know an area with, uh, with the wide range in time and distance that the debris is, the, the, the debris area is um, or is looking at that that certainly has with its significant uncertainty. Um, but at the same time, um, it's helpful in understanding where debris might end up and where and when. But on shore, as I mentioned before, working to establish those monitoring and protocol, monitoring sites and protocols to get baseline data and have comparison of you know how the debris changes in both composition um, and quantity over time, and then working with planning and preparedness um, to so that's something that we're working on a regional level is to 
spin off these contingency planning efforts. Um, there's been a workshop in Hawaii to work with federal agencies in Hawaii as well as state government, one just a few weeks ago in Washington, and we're working with um, state federal agencies in Alaska too to, to evaluate how, how, to, how to integrate that contingency planning effort. And lastly, communicating these efforts out. So um, getting, trying to get the best information out on what people can be doing, how they can, how they can interact with debris, and how they can help in the effort. And on that, um, just wanted to jot kind of a few, a few ideas down um, on you know potential National Park Service engagement. I know there's other folks that are online potentially, but um, you know certainly we've really appreciated the engagement to this point. And so I've kind of mixed you know um, mixed kind of what what National Park Service people have already been doing um, in here. So certainly feedback and input. We really appreciate the input back from. National Park Service employees and from the general public on, um, you know, what are questions that are out there and what can be done. So, um, and that kind of goes down to the, a few bullets down, but communicating and asking local questions about about concerns, we certainly appreciate that because, you know, the more questions that are out there, the more we're able to understand um, what we can be communicating. Because there's a lot of different efforts and layers have uh, layers of effort on this overall issue, um, but getting that information out is certainly something we want to be make sure we're doing the best job we possibly can of. Um, and so we're doing that through outreach and education. And so um, materials, understanding kind of what's out there, what would be helpful, and coordinating or, or um, no, you know, making us aware, or making, you know, working in local education. Um, and then also, you know, getting out the word that we're accepting and, and looking for um, input from people um, on what they see at disasterdebris at noah.gov at that email account. With, uh, so we're asking people to report in what they do see. So really, there are a lot of opportunities for local engagement, and um, you know, kind of overall, I would say certainly on that, it's giving us giving us that feedback, reporting sightings in is very much helpful, um, staying informed and, and keeping us posted on what would be helpful to be aware of. Again, that traces back to that feedback point, um, and then also getting engaged and, and working in local volunteer efforts because certainly marine debris, as I mentioned and said before, it's you know, there's already a lot of good work being done on the marine debris issue overall. And so certainly there's there are opportunities for engagement and volunteering in that. So with that, I wanted to say thanks very much and um, see open it up for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Um, we do have some questions coming in, um, and if you do have questions, folks, go ahead and type them into. Um, the question box, and uh, I'll start with one here that says, are there any gyres in the North Pacific that could concentrate tsunami debris as it moves across the ocean? That is a very good question. Let me just I'm gonna flip back, pardon, go to a map here. Okay. Sorry, my, flip, my random slide flipping. Um, it's a very good question, um, sir or ma'am, sorry, not sure who asked, but um, if you can see my cursor, there are. Um, so they're commonly known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch or the Eastern Pacific Garbage Patch. That's an uh, area of concentration which you know, very roughly exists between um, the California coastline and Hawaii. It really is it's amorphous. It's not kind of a fixed area, um, but it is an area where the currents, so you have the North Pacific Current that splits into the Alaska that has, comes up in the Gulf and the California that comes down the California coastline. Um, as they circle back, they create this gyre here, roughly in this area, that can concentrate debris. So um, we have seen that you know, that the model show that debris that on its way could either end up there, or debris that doesn't make impact or make landfall on the on the west coast could circle back into that area. So there could certainly be a mixture, and that's part of the reason why we expect to see, you know, tsunami debris um, or debris that could be from a tsunami. Um, to be something that could arrive on shores for over a long period of time, even though it might be difficult to, to say what, you know, to identify it specifically. Okay, here's another question. Um, what is known about accumulation rates in the Alaska region? And, you know, we have these anecdotal versions of people saying, oh, I'm seeing a higher concentration in Montague that I'm, that I'm used to. Mm -hmm. Is it just anecdotal, or do we have some hard data on accumulation rates so that if we do see an increase, we can really firmly document that with some data? That's a really good question. Um, 
In many places, it is it is kind of it's more on the anecdotal. Um, although we certainly don't want to discount that because you know local knowledge is important. Um, you know, especially in the absence of you know hard trend data. However, in other places, we do have time series that go back. So, um, looking at the same map at the four sites in kind of the more eastern Gulf Alaska area um, at Middleton, Kayak, Yakutat, and Krutsaw, we do have a time series that goes back um, into the 1980s um, for marine debris accumulation rates. Um, now, it's specifically targeted more accumulation, um, I'm sorry, more debris that was an entanglement hazard, but it does include other debris data as well. And so um, that's going to be invaluable in getting that answer of, well, what's the, what's the change? What's the delta? Um, However, we're, we're also spinning up monitoring monitoring in other places. I think that's also why the data out in the Aleutians could be very helpful um, since um, you know, models show that high windage debris um, isn't that likely to have impacted there yet. That could have some baseline um, data to, to show against, hopefully. Okay, thanks. Here's another one. Um, you addressed, uh, you know, um, radioactivity as contamination, but uh, what about levels of hazmat? And the question is really, are we to expect a higher concentration of hazmat in tsunami debris than we would expect in just general marine debris because of the source, you know, being these coastal communities? That's a good question. And unfortunately there isn't a firm there isn't a firm, you know, yes, there should be more, no, there shouldn't there should be less. There's really, you know, just um, the answer that there is a potential that hazmat could exist in tsunami debris based on what was impacted. Uh, you know, it's the tsunami impacted area that was, you know, very diversely developed. So you've got industrial, you've got homes, you've got, um, you know, a lot of different, a lot of different um, infrastructure. So um, you could there is the potential for hazmat in amongst that. Just but as there already is with you know existing existing marine debris. And so um, that's something that we're going to. We are working and are continuing to work more with the local groups to try to understand better what are the best handling protocols. Um, you know, certainly we're telling and asking people to be safe. You know, if there if there is any concern about the object, you know, to to not manipulate it, not work with it. But um, it is something that's we're working more towards in that area because um, those protocols are different in every every region. They're not going to be the same in California as they are in. Um, you know, Alaska as a whole, certainly, but even the protocols in different areas can be different of who you would contact and how. So we're working on that. Okay, here's another one, uh, Peter. Do the counterclockwise circulation patterns of the Aleutian low storm tracks tend to concentrate more debris in Alaska? And would an increase in storms in this area increase the rates of debris making landfall in Alaska? You know, that's a, a good question. Um, the certainly the storm activity, and we haven't, you know, we have, we're not data to say how much of the higher deposition rates in Alaska, you know, directly related to storms versus other. But certainly there are high rates of deposition in Alaska, um, and for higher windage debris, it would make sense that storm activity would push push more debris towards that, um, towards the shores. Um, so um, that and all, and, and you know the one of the things that some of the parks, some of the, um, the monitoring sites is trying to look at this year is actually looking at um, selecting beaches that are more wind exposed versus beaches that are more wind sheltered um, to kind of, but in similar areas in order to get um, sort of that differential a little bit of how much of that, you know, that wind driven debris and how much of it is current driven debris that's arriving. So it's, it's a very good question though. And, and I think one that's, this this uh, early debris is showing that there's a lot of wind driven debris that's that can arrive. Okay, thank you. You also mentioned, um, you know, the importance of communication outreach to um, local communities. Are there any outreach materials that NOAA has developed other than the sort of the modeling, um, you know, PDFs that have been floating around on emails? Um, so are there any outreach materials or specific messages, you know, that NOAA has developed that we should be using locally? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we've been, you guys are asking all, all, all the good questions, so that's great. Um, 
we have um, a one pager, which unfortunately we just we've, we're in the process of um, revamping it because it had some of the older information in it some, since before some more recent sighting. So we didn't want to have uh, you know keep the old version that was incorrect up on the website. Um, so we're working on an updated one pager that's more general, um, and then we're also working with the communication staff from um, state and federal agencies to try to you know give the best information we can um, so that they have that to spread out to their stakeholder networks and you know, who they know, basically. You know, it's kind of the, you tell one person and they tell their friends, basically. Um, separately, I know I've got an Alaska marine redistribution list, um, which is really just an informal kind of an email list um, that I keep, um, that I send out kind of updates just more on an, um, kind of an ad hoc basis, um, saying, you know, as sort of new things happen, so as if we get a new model result that's a little different than what was came out before, or if we get um, influx of sightings, kind of to give kind of an update of okay, well you know here's what we're seeing or here's what's going on. Um, typically before the tsunami, the tsunami, the we use the distribution list mainly for like conference notices and, and funding. You know if we if the grant came open that kind of thing, um, but it's been helpful. At least hopefully people found it helpful to be on there just to kind of get the update directly. Okay, so on that one page, or when do you anticipate that being um, revised and available? It sounds like a good starting point for those of us who are trying to develop some messaging. Uh, for the yeah, no, the, um, that's a good question. I'll check in with our outreach person. Um, I think the ans last answer, when I talked to her earlier in the week, she was hoping this week, um, but she's she's been uh, working really hard on a lot of different fronts. So I'll check in and I can circle back. Who, who's asking that one? Just so I know who to check back in. Uh, that's coming from here at Kenai Fjords, where we're uh, thinking of developing some uh, interpretive messaging for the yeah. public. Tremendous. If, um, is that, so at a Jim or a John, I can check back in with you on that? Yes, certainly. Yeah, right. if you could check in with me on that, it would be great. Um, and then um, one more question along that line. I think you referred to this, um, so maybe it's clear to everybody, but uh, if we are or if we have field crews out there that are encountering debris, um, you know, let's assume they may, they're may they not in a position to clean it up, but it, it's worth documenting, maybe GPSing, and then that would go to disasterdebris at NOAA.gov as a sighting. Is that the exactly correct, correct way to so, sort of... Thanks very much for asking. If if there is something that you see that is, um, you know, uh, some, an object that you think could be potentially tsunami debris, and, you know, at that point, you know, some of it is that, a lot of that, that is the local knowledge of, you know, what you normally see as debris and what's abnormal. There's some sort of identifying marker that makes you think it could be snowing debris. Emailing that in with, like you said, um, what you saw, where you saw it, when, um, as much information as is practical about the object. Pictures are great, but emailing that into that disaster re at NOAA.gov account um, is very helpful for us in kind of constructing a picture of where people are seeing things and in what densities and uh, that information. So really appreciate that, and thanks for asking for the clarification. Well, I just know of at least uh, one, and, and I've heard rumor of another sighting here locally outside of Seward that, you know, are not on your list of sort of five sightings yet. And so uh, I, I'll try to pass that on to the folks that are involved with those sightings so that you can add them to your to your list and uh, get a better picture of what's going on up here. Great. And, and in some of those cases, I, I should say that um, I know, so we've got a got a few people who are manning that that email account and so sometimes it can get you know we ha like if we get an influx of sightings and we can get a day or two behind on on the uh, tracking of it so uh, um, hopefully people that as they get it in you know as it should it can take a little while to get on the map but um, we're sure. working on making that as fast as possible understood all right well I'm not seeing any more questions coming in from the general uh, audience out there, and I think you've answered the ones that I had on my list too, Peter. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, and I hate to say it, but I think we'll probably have some sightings for you, <laughs> you know, as no, the no. summer progresses here at Kenai Fjords. I mean, we're, we're glad to know where to send the sightings now is, I guess, the, the upshot of that because, uh, um, you know, I wish this stuff wasn't out there, but it is. And it's going to be on our beaches soon. So. No, certainly we appreciate we appreciate the input, and also as you know, as as we move towards and continue to move towards um, engagement on 
um, next steps for you know planning and for you know we really appreciate the engagement from the National Park Service on you know getting gathering data, pointing you know spreading good information um, because certainly it's you know, this is going to be an issue that's not going to be a one year phenomena. It's not something where you know tsunami debris will start arriving on one date and then end on another predictable date. It's um, it's going to be something where it's going to be mixed in with the existing debris problem, but potentially add to it for a period of, for a long period of time. So we really appreciate the engagement and interest. All right. Well, on behalf of the poet um, webinar group, I'd like to thank you again for um, your time and thanks uh, to everyone for attending. Um, just so you know, this webinar will be archived on the Ocean Alaska Science and Learning Center website. That's www.oceanalaska.org. And also, our next webinar will be in July. It'll be in the third week of July. Look for a notice coming out. We're going to have Dr. John Kennish speaking about marine plastics and toxicity, some of the studies that he's been doing about the toxicity of these microplastics in the marine environment. So and if you don't mind me saying so, that's a very, I've, I've heard him speak and he, he does a very good job of explaining that. Great. Uh, yeah, we're very much looking forward to that. Um, and that'll wrap it up for today. Thanks to everybody involved. Thank you.